This week, Rwanda marks 25 years since the country's 1994 genocide. The assassination of Rwandan President Jovanel Habaya Rima set off the massacre of an estimate of about a million deaths in the country. Today, having risen from the horrific years of the genocide, Rwanda has turned itself around and the country is an important example of economic growth and development. Faith Mabera, senior researcher from the Institute for Global Dialogue, joins us from Hatfield, Pretoria, to talk to us about uh, this 25-year anniversary. Thank you, Faith. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Leanne. Let's, let's go back uh, 25 years. Now, we spoke to the fact that this was all triggered by the killing of the then president. Talk to us a little bit more about the divisions, the, 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 the Tutsis and, and, and everything that was going on at that time. How did this Rwandan genocide start? So, um, you're quite right in saying that we need to look back at history and the fact that uh, the Belgian colonial system and, and the years that it, it went by in crafting a divide and rule system that actually resulted in inst instigating um, a sort of situation where we see the, the Tutsi uh, assuming almost an aristocratic um, overseer authority over the, the Hutu in as much as the Hutu were majority. And in this way also remember during the colonial system there was the carrying of ID cards uh, which stipulate, stipulated the ethnic identity of the card holder. This actually played a, another key role in the genocide that we later see that happened um, in April in 1994. And, and we see the divide and rule system um, almost created an artificial um, uh, antagonistic uh, class system that later on built into years of accumulated animosity and, and antagonism between uh, the two ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. So what we see is a very carefully concerted effort. It involved the propaganda, it, it involved the military, it involved um, even ordinary uh, neighbors um, and, and the inculcation of an almost, um, the, 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 the genocide me uh, mentality was swiftly was um, expertly planned and and here why I'm emphasizing on the idea of the, the planning is because we need to um, the, the, the Rwandan pr uh, program of Kwibuka which in Kenya Rwanda means um, remember is actually another effort at, at dismissing the narrative that the genocide just happened because it didn't just happen it was a, like I said a very concerted and a very planned um, um, 100 days of, of killing I mean, so in that context of history it's important to, to remember that the colonial element also yeah. um, is key. I mean, it is so important to look back at this time. I mean, the stories that came from Rwanda and, and still shock and horrify people. I mean, as you mentioned, neighbors killing neighbors. There were even husbands killing wives that were threatened. If they did not do it, they would lose their lives. What shocked me most was you even found that people within churches, um, priests and, 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 uh, and the likes, actually facing charges of murder for also embarking on this killing. I mean, this was meticulously planned and this was almost a cleanse. Yes, it was, it was meticulously planned. I mean, you had lists of people's names um, in the hands of perpetrators and they would go from door to door. Um, and and uh, you can imagine for the case of the Tutsi, when you have the majority of the population turning on you, you have nowhere to run. Um, in, in that sense. So it was, uh, it was the hacking and the use of machetes and the dismembering of bodies. And for days, um, I think for me what is even more traumatic in terms from a memory perspective, um, bodies uh, were found in Lake Kivu, bodies were found as far as Uganda and DRC, the piling up of, of bodies and the, and, the, and the running and pouring of blood was something that is surely unforgettable. Hence the mantra that we've seen throughout the years with reference to mass atrocities that we, indeed they should never again be a genocide in the likes of what happened in Rwanda in 1994. Yeah, I, I want to talk about the turnaround, and, but I'll do that in a short while. I just want to still focus on, on what actually happened happened during that time. I think a big question and a lot of people are always asking, why did nobody intervene at that time? This went on for a hundred days. We talk about a million people being killed. Um, as far as history tells us, we know that the UN and Belgium had forces in Rwanda, but the UN mission was not given a mandate to actually stop the killings. Why? What, what happened there? 
So you are right, uh, Lian. At the time, there was a, a light footprint uh, peacekeeping mission in Rwanda. And remember, this was obviously in the aftermath of the civil war that had happened um, in 92 and obviously had cul uh, culminated in the ceasefire that um, led up to now the shooting of the plane of President Habyarimana. But essentially what happened, like you said, at this case, remember, in the 90s, from an international relations, from an international politics perspective, we had this case where breach of sovereignty was actually something that was looked down up upon. So um, the international community in this regard, and here I'm referring obviously to, to the UN Security Council, the, the, the narrative and the debate that was happening in the Security Council dimension for this, is which, which in this case had the mandate to authorize any, any upscaling of, of intervention from a UN peacekeeping force. At that time, the narrative was that this was uh, a, a, a matter that was domestic. This was a, a, a localized problem that had to be dealt. Yet on the ground, you had um, uh, Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, who led the UN peacekeeping uh, mission at the time, sending cables um, to, to New York and saying that what you are seeing in the ground is actually a case of, of um, um, ethnic cleansing, it's a case of genocide and we need to act down. But um, as a result of the, 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 the almost delayed response by the, the international community, it became a case of a, 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 a little too late. And you can imagine in a scale of 100 days, the killing of that scale yeah. meant that you had to have a quick approach. So um, the del deliberations, the going roundabout discussions, the, the unwillingness to actually go around this this uh, norm, international norm, as I'm saying, of sovereignty was one of the, I think, the key aspects that led to delayed action in the case of Rwanda. And then, and then finally, just to wrap the, 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 the actual history up, how did it all end? I mean, what, 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 what actually led to the conclusion of this genocide? So um, the conclusion of the genocide, as, as um, you, you're rightly in pointing, was the, the invasion of now President um, uh, Paul Kagame, who was in exile at the time, um, leading the Rwanda Patriotic from Front, entered, um, uh, led his forces, I mean, to enter um, Rwanda from the West, Uganda. And we see the RPF trying now to counter the Interahamwe, um, who are the, the Hutu majority and the, and the militant group, and, and um, actually um, delivering and, and, and liberating um, the Rwandan society from, from the genocide. And what is interesting, though, actually a light footprint French French mission that now history has shown actually aided some of the genocides into heading into um, uh, escaping into into neighboring Congo um, and and this is obviously now has replicated in, in current events um, mm -hmm. with, with 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 what you've seen the tensions happening in the Eastern African region but it, it was a very um, um, also uh, carefully planned um, guerrilla sort of movement if you want to, to call it that by by Kagame at that time was expertly hailed for his military expertise in fact at the time Kagame was called the Napoleon of Africa because of the kind of discipline that that he instilled in the Rwanda Patriotic Front in countering the, the genocide and the genocide movement. Yeah. I mean, you, you, I suppose, look back at a time like this and actually ask that question, has anyone ever faced justice for this? Uh, uh, pardon, just repeat that ha for me, Leon. Has anyone actually ever faced justice for this? I mean, if we look at the International Criminal Court set up in 2002, um, you know, this was long after the Rwandan genocide. Ha has justice ever been served? So the, the question of justice, and in this case, it's restorative and retributive justice. I think it's important now when we look at history of, of Rwanda and what has happened in the aftermath of the genocide. So Rwanda initiated a communi community-based traditional mode of justice, what we call the Gachacha um, community-based tribunal. Um, and what we see here is you see in the community, you see victim, victim um, you see perpetrator and, and, and families of the victim actually holding and sitting in community, sitting on the grass, sitting in communal spaces, interacting in a conversation and, and, and letting the, the perpetrators uh, um, explain their role in the, in the killing, um, account for their role in, and, and obviously the people who sit, the community who sit in here on this, on this hearings are the ones who um, sort of decide on the best course of action. And this was important because you can imagine in the aftermath of the genocide, you had hundreds of thousands of perpetrators 
perpetrators what do you do in a case where even the the state machinery cannot i mean cannot absorb all these hundreds of thousands of perpetrators so obviously the recourse to the community based um, justice model was was important and i think this is where we we hold a lesson about um, homegrown initiatives mm -hmm. at justice but we obviously from an international perspective you had the international tribunal um, for rwanda where you had to see um, um, uh, the, the more severe cases the the, the highly ranked um, sort of operatives in in this um, um, sort of um, operation um, getting held to account from an international um, uh, law perspective, but much had to be done um, at the local level. But we see that still going on. There's still some um, genocides who are still actually being looked for even as we speak 25 years later. But um, largely from a conflict transformation perspective, I think the Gachacha community based trial uh, key entry point into um, local peace building initiatives in yeah. So we look now to today, and I mean, many people look on at Rwanda and say it's, it's, a, it's an absolute wonder. I mean, you look at how far they've come in these 25 years. You've all got all of this under President Kagame. He's really been hailed for transforming the devastated country economically, um, technologically, everything. Although th there is still speculation around his leadership, because uh, if anybody disagrees with him, there's also been talk that he, he doesn't take too kindly to people that are against him. And I mean, he just won his third term in uh, 2017 by something like 98.6% percent of the entire vote. I mean, that's, it's, yeah, it, I mean, that's, that's massive. It's almost unheard of. Talk to us about the turnaround of Rwanda and, and where, where we sit right now as that, as that country. So um, you, you're right in pointing out that um, Rwanda now has, has been hailed as an economic success story and certainly one for other African countries to emulate. But we, we, the question that we're essentially asking ourselves is can the Rwandan model be replicated elsewhere on the continent? And this is where it gets interesting because you see within, within the Rwanda post-genocide recovery story and, and, and the crafting of what we call the developmental state, we see the, the state-led initiatives in actually crafting uh, a macro leading the macroeconomic recovery of the region at the hands of a, a leader who has a very strong control on the patronage networks. We actually see the ruling party having um, an investment vehicle in the form of the TriStar Investments, which actually invests in, 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 in key sectors of the economy and takes the, the returns and invests them back into the economy. So the question is also, at what cost has this... Um, economic success story been built on and it's been forged number one on on the sacrifice of, of political freedoms and and you're right in pointing out the suppression of of um, oppression um, Rwanda has actually become one of the the, the biggest surveillance states the, the amount of surveillance by the state on, on citizens in the name of um, cutting down and hacking down on any talk of of um, um, talk of, of division um, in a country that's healing um, and, and, and the, the building of what we call a post-ethnic um, no, and uh, in addition to a post-conflict society in Rwanda is also one where we've seen ethnicity has been crafted as this construct that that had caused all the, the pain and the hurt and the trauma in the country's um, recent history. Mm. So, the, like I said, the sacrifice is, is, is on the political freedoms, the sacrifice is on the, on the basic human rights. The, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, number one, what happens upon Kagame's exit? Because he's crafted for himself a role um, as this strongman um, on, 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 on the African, uh, on the Rwandan consciousness and on Rwandan society. So do we see a case of where there is peace, but negative peace in the sense that there's an easy relations and there's a harsh and a pretending peace situation um, in Rwanda? And what happens, for instance, if Kagame exits, at, like you said, at the end of 2034, will we see a return back and, and structural violence that is inherent within the, the layers of society leading to another implosion 
um, of violence. Those, I think, are the nuanced um, elements that we have to look for in, the, yeah. in terms of the peace compact that we see existing in, in Rwanda at the moment. Faith, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap the interview, but I'm, I'm going to ask you very quickly, if at all, um, to talk to us, because a lot of people look at Rwanda, and then we look at South Africa, and we have such similar time frames. 1994, South Africa uh, gets its first democratically elected president, moves into elections. We see what happened within Rwanda at that time. We've spoken at length about that. And yet there's that parallel that's drawn between the two countries. Um, and who's progressed further and what we can look at as, as countries that really do have not necessarily similar histories, but, you know, at the same time uh, went through transitions. What, is your, what are your views on, on both countries if we compare them? Um, I think importantly, Lian, the question of leadership emerges in this sense because we see the kind of visionary leadership that Kagame um, has provided for Rwanda, um, obviously in, in full regard of, of all the accusations and the controversies that have come with his autocratic, um, if you want to call it that, rule. So leadership is important and the kind of, of direction, the kind of, um, uh, of, of strength that a strong state presents, cap building the capacity of the state having a accountable leadership and good governance mechanism in place has um, for the establishment of democracy and and the, and and the progression of society that's number one and I think number two is the broader question of justice and reconciliation you've you've drawn the parallels between the the, the TRC in South Africa and the gachacha um, uh, like I mentioned in Rwanda but the, the question of reconciliation has to also look at where the national and the interpersonal in, in interest intersect You've seen, for instance, in South Africa, yes, there's been the question of am amnesty, but the accountability measures that come, the follow-up that comes with the reconciliation process has been one that has been largely um, absent in, in the psyche of the nation in terms of building a social cohesion. So I think also we have to um, ask, ask, ask of the hard questions around mm -hmm. reconciliation, around the interpersonal relationships between victim, uh, victim family and perpetrator in this case, mm -hmm. and, and, and um, begin to really address um, the, the grassroots level and the community-based um, level of, of, of conflict transformation in this regard. Those are the two that I would point in terms of, of um, looking at a comparative aspect of okay. Rwanda and, and South Africa. Faith, thank you so much yeah. for that very enlightening conversation. Faith Mabera, senior researcher at the Institute for Global Dialogue, talking to us about the history of Rwanda 25 years after the devastating genocide. We take a break. News after this.